Imagine for a moment that you were a child growing up in Africa or maybe India. As the years go by, it gets hotter and hotter. Think suffocating heat and wildfires become common occurrences. You really wonder when the next rain is ever going to fall, but when it does fall, it comes really hard, it comes really fast, floods your homes, destroys your crops. Between the fires and the floods and the droughts, you're not sure where you're going to get your next meal. You're facing starvation. What you really want to do is you want to work to support your community. You want to go to school, but you're spending your time traveling long distance to find fresh water or food, or you're trying to find shelter to escape the killing heat. You really wonder where the blue skies have gone. And you ask about the fairness of it all, that the use of the world's resources to support the prosperity of children that, were support, that had just had the fortune of being born one cotton away from you was causing the climate change that makes your life a daily struggle. And you will not be alone because a majority of the babies born in the next century will be facing these exact same challenges. They're being born in the global south, largely Africa and parts of Asia. And you can ask, well, is it fair for these children to have at least even, even part of the prosperity or access to resources that our children born in the United States have. If you do that, you can figure out and plot it out very quickly and find out that we need to provide 50% more food, 50% more fresh water, and 50% more energy to make that happen, not in the next century, but in the next decade or two. So this is a talk about hope, and I want to make sure that these children have hope. Now, the great thing about this is that challenges provide opportunities. And a lot of these children will be born in economies that have not been learned to depend on fossil fuel as their form of power. They can develop new technologies of the future as opposed to destructive technologies of the past, potentially leapfrog more and more industrial nations and be the leaders of a new economy. But this is almost always faced with wicked trade-offs. So how do we deal with the wicked trade-offs between food, water, and energy? I want to give you an example of one of them. This is an area in Borneo where they are trying to basically develop palm oil plants to, to provide biofuels and vegetable oils and grow their economy. Sounds good, but they're doing this at the destruction of their rainforests, destruction of the lands to grow other crops, and the destruction of their culture and the indigenous communities. Let me take some place closer to home, California. We're the leaders in the, in the United States in terms of installing solar farms, and it sounds great. But we're doing this by basically removing a lot of our farmland from production or endangering our fragile desert ecosystems. So we're basically doing a trade-off between providing energy with food. Now, we know how to grow more food. The way to grow more food is to use more water. But our freshwater resources are also going um, by the wayside. So, the question is, what are, what are the answers? And that's one of the things that my research tries to focus on. So let me show you a, a potential interesting idea. This is a greenhouse, actually, in Saudi Arabia that grows 10 times the amount of food with 10 times less fresh water versus open agriculture. It can do this very easily because it takes advantage of vertical farming. It takes advantage of the fact that you don't have to worry about exposure of insects or storms or high winds to damage the crops. But more importantly, it takes advantage of understanding the water cycle. So our water cycle is very simple. When rain comes from the, um, from the sky or when we water plants, we know where our water goes. Our water goes back into the ground table. Our water goes into runoff into our rivers and our oceans and our lakes. And then a lot of the water gets evaporated and goes up into the air. It forms clouds, right? But if it's runoff or it's clouds, the water's not, not retained locally. And in fact, in clouds, because of climate change, the clouds are deciding to dump more and more of their water right over the ocean, which basically means our, our access to fresh water resources on land are less. But if you do it in a greenhouse, 
What's really nice is you retain all that water because the water instead condenses on the roof of the greenhouse and gets collected. And so you can pretty much save almost all the water in a greenhouse. This makes them very super efficient. Moreover, you can even take seawater from the ocean, bring it into the greenhouse, and create fresh water from evaporation. Because of this, we know how to create, how to grow enough food and using very, very little water to meet our global food needs in the next century. However, the question is how to do this economically and how to deal with electricity. Let me ask, let me deal with electricity first. One of the really beautiful hopes that have happened in the last decade is that renewable electricity, electric from, electricity from solar power plants, is now cheaper, less expensive than fossil fuel power. By quite a bit, actually, almost by a factor of two. The issue has always been where to put these solar power plants. In California and a lot of other areas, we're, using, we're putting the plants in areas which are actually either destroy, affecting or destroying our, our, our desert ecosystems, or we're actually putting it over areas that we used to have cultivated crops, which is reducing the ability for us to produce food. Okay. Some people say, well, this isn't a problem really, you just put it on roofs. But the problem is, is that rooftop solar insulation is much more expensive. It's actually much more expensive than fossil fuel generation. And it has issues with fire, which is becoming increasingly important, at least in California, um, as well as scalability and uh, regulations. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out, answer the question, where do we put these solar plants? To understand that, you have to understand what the color of the sun is. You all know the color of the sun. It's kind of yellowish or orange. But the actual peak wavelength of sun that falls on us is, is, actually, is green. Okay. Plants are green not because they absorb the, sun's solar, the peak sun, of the sun's power. They actually don't like the sun's power, the peak's power at all. It hurts the plants. They actually reflect it. So plants don't use the peak power of the sun. If you go down to the store and buy actually a grow lamp now, we have LED technology, what you'll see is the LEDs are all blue and they're all red. There's no green, there's no white anymore. And the reason for that is the plants only use two wavelengths of the sun. They only use the blue and they only use the red. Okay? They only use 20% of the solar spectrum altogether. The lights are pink, plants like pink. Which is really good because my lab loves pink. So my lab actually is researching how to use pink light better. But instead of using LEDs, which actually take power, we use a luminescent material, a fluorescent material, kind of like you see in kids' toys. You ever seen those floaty toys in the thing that are kind of pink? I use the same type of material. So I just convert those wavelengths of light, the green portion of the light that plants don't use, and I make it red just, by just, just, just through the process known as fluorescent. And the plants love that. It enhances plant growth. On the end, that wouldn't be unique. That idea has been around for a while. But what we also do is we take the, the light that plants don't use, we waveguide it to photovoltaic cells, and we actually generate electricity. That allows us to generate electricity and grow plants on the same piece of land. Moreover, because photovoltaics, if you've ever seen a power plant, a photo solar power plant, you'll know that there's a structure, a metal structure, to hold up the panels. And you know that there's glass to hold the PV cells. Our glass is the roof of the greenhouse. Our frame is the greenhouse structure, which basically means we're providing the greenhouse essentially for free. Okay. Now the question is, does this scale? You can look at the amount of cropland available in the United States. And you can do a very simple algebra. I love algebra. And what you'll find out is you need to use about 10% of our current cropland. You cover about 10% of our cropland with these electricity generating greenhouses, you'll provide enough power, enough food, and save enough fresh water to supply all the world's demands up to 2100. Okay? So, and the idea, and the whole idea is to do this economically viable so that communities can install it for free as their power generation. So imagine again that you're living in Africa, you're now a young adult, hopefully, ready to make decisions. You can implement technologies such as these, where your community can, can not even bother adopting carbon-based power, fossil fuel-based power plants in the first. You can do renewable energy power plants, and make sure that you can grow all your fresh water, or grow all your fresh fruit, and have all your fresh water you need for your community to survive. You can spend your time looking at and understanding why the sky is blue, because you'll have a lot of blue skies, why plants are green, because you'll have a lot of greenery around you. 
and focused on how to help the economy of your community other than, rather than the daily struggles. This is my vision for hope for our future, that we'll have plentiful water, food, and energy for everybody without depleting our natural resources, and we, all the children of the world have a chance to dream. Thank you.